Hey everyone, it's Peter Kerr from Rock Daydream Nation and I've got three friends to the channel back on board and we are going to talk about Whitesnake 1987. I've got John Clauser from My Music Corner, I've got Reed Little from The Contrarians and I've got Tim Derling from Tim's Vinyl Confessions. How are you gents? Fantastic good Peter, good. can't wait for this one. We are going to talk about Whitesnake 1987, the uber mega hit. I think it's currently sold in excess of 8 million copies in the US. This was easily the largest selling album for David Coverdale and Whitesnake. We're going to talk about what was our first impressions in the day of this album. We are going to do a spotlight on each of the songs, and then we're going to talk about the drama John Sykes, where we think this album rates today. So I might throw it over to you, Mr. John Clauser. Tell us about what was your first impressions right. of Whitesnake 1987 in the day? So for me, I'm probably the, the most casual fan of the four of us here. I don't have the lineage of the Deep Purple family tree. All of that post um, Ian Gillen era, foreign to me. I don't, I know hardly anything of Deep Purple. So the first time I actually even hear White Snake is the, sl uh, the slow and easy video. So, but I never really pursued slide it in from there. So when I first, when I first heard stuff off of this, uh, I heard still of the night on top 40 radio, which top 40 radio was playing a lot of stuff. That I didn't really care to listen to because I was really into heavier stuff. So when still of the night would come on, I thought, Okay, well, this is kind of cool. Uh, I kind of dig that riff that I can do without the keyboards a little bit, but I, I could kind of dig this riff. It's pretty heavy. I eventually got the album. I don't know what made me finally get it. Uh, if I heard uh, maybe Here I Go Again or something I heard, and I eventually picked it up. And then the first, you know, the, the first thing you're bludgeoned with is that beginning to crying in the rain. So um, back in the day, this was this truly really was my introduction to to White Snake. Nice. Reed Little, what was your first introduction to this album? Your first impression of the album? Well, uh, not dissimilar to John's, actually. Uh, not surprising as we're similar in age, but um, I knew people that had slided in. I didn't know anybody who had any of the earlier White Snake albums. Those were all imports uh, in the U.S. back in the day. And I didn't know anybody in Montana who had import rock and roll records, right? So I knew of Slide It In, wasn't really a fan. Um, the first I remember hearing from this album was on the show Metal Shop. We used to have this radio show called Metal Shop. And um, they opened up with Still of the Night. And that riff is just so catchy. We'll talk about the songs as we go. But I was like, yep, I'm in. And I got the album and I was like, huh, the uh, Still of the Night really does not represent what this album and band is. Um, and that impression hasn't really changed since 1987. Uh, I even saw this tour, which uh, we can talk about when we get to Legacy. Um, but yes, overall, I think this album, I think of it as the Hey, Look at Me album, because I think David Coverdale and John Sykes are both screaming, Hey, Look at Me, in the top of their lungs uh, on this album, successfully, as it turns out. Um, and I think it divides, at least the US release, which is nine songs, divides very neatly up into three different sections. Think of it as the power section, the AOR hit section, and the less power section, which closes out the album. So I can kind of justify that as we go through the songs. Nice. Thanks, Reed. And Tim, what about you? So I, I would have been 12 going on 13 in 1987. Pivotal year for me because I had, uh, you know, I had just gotten into Bon Jovi with Slipper and Wet. That was my total gateway album into hard rock. People older than me laugh at that. People younger than me laugh at that. But when you were 12 years old, You Give Love a Bad Name was the coolest thing you ever heard on Top 40 Radio. So what it did is gave me an appetite for bands like that. I wanted to find other bands like that. 
I hadn't heard of White Snake. Um, you know, I, I'd heard of Deep Purple, but I couldn't tell you one thing about them. I'd heard the name. It was all very, very new. Well, I happened to see the video for Still of the Night. We all know what the video looks like. But most importantly, and the lasting legacy, it was a cool song. It had twists and turns that I wasn't used to in a song. I was used to basically verse, chorus, verse, chorus, solo, bridge and chorus this song stopped and started but when it started up again it, the, the that was one of the it was a literally a snaky riff like it was a it was a circular kind of riff and it was hypnotic and i was like wow like I, it, it this is really cool um and with here i go again i mean this was the heyday of bands like this able to have Big hit singles. Number one song with Here I Go Again. Number two song with Is This Love. And early 1988, finally, I, I bought the cassette. I and mean, this is this is the record, but I bought the cassette. And I listened to it all the time. All the time. The whole album. And Reed's absolutely right. It's a schizophrenic album. But we'll, we'll get to that when we get to the songs. But then I did something that I used to think everybody did this, but not everybody did this. I went back to find out what else there was from White Snake. Unfortunately, Geffen had reissued the bulk of the catalog, and I realized that I was dealing with very, very different sounds, all encompassed in this group called White Snake. But as far as the legacy of this album, um, I'd love to see it go diamond someday. You know, it's it's the one White Snake album that stands a chance. It's really, really hard to believe that. Unlike most other hard rock bands that had like peaks and valleys in their throughout their career, White Snake were huge in 87, 88, and they never got there again. It was the, it's this huge blip on the radar as far as the big wide world goes. Um, but yeah, that's it, it's one of the very, very first what you'd call hard rock albums I have to listen to all the way through. And it's an album that I really don't need to play because I know it so well I can play it in my head. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tim. Nice. My gateway to hard rock and heavy metal was um, in high school, and it was a compilation album called Deepest Purple. And that opened my ears to the sounds of Richie Blackmore. There were a couple of songs on that album that had uh, David Coverdale and Glenn Hughes, Burn and Stormbringer. I went to a record store, and sometimes when you go into a record store, you buy it on the basis of the album cover. I had in two hands, I had Uriah Heap, Innocent Victim, which had a snake and its mouth open. And then in the other hand, I had White Snake Come and Get It, where you had a snake and an apple. I chose White Snake Come and Get It. And there was my journey with White Snake. I became the biggest White Snake fan in my high school. I was probably the only guy in high school that, you know, um, knew about White Snake because they weren't really big in Australia. I love that sort of John Lord, um, Bernie Marsden, uh, Mick Moody, bluesy, boogie rock. And I, I followed their career. I was just like the number one Whitesnake fan in high school. So I know that I was following in Kerrang! magazine this whole saga, you know, post slided in and the recording of 1987, went to my local record store and I put an order in that as soon as it became available, I wanted that album. So I got 1987, I got the US version, and it was like on day one of release, you know, import. Put the needle on that first track of Crying in the Rain, and it was like, what the hell? It was just over the top. It was so heavy. I was not prepared to hear how heavy this album was sounding. It was just electric because... I had grown up with that bluesy rock of David Coverdale, and a lot of it is very subtle. But to hear how, you know, three or four years later from Come and Get It, or well, maybe six years later, to 1987, how electrified it was, I was just absolutely shocked. All the songs on that first side, hit, 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 just hit you between the eyes. I loved it. It's, a, it's an album that I play co constantly. I am a traditionalist. I like the old White Snake, 
But as we go further into this conversation, I've come, you know, to grips with how it fits in with the discography. And it's a very important part of, you know, in my my view of hard rock and heavy metal history in, in the 80s. So um, I loved it then. And um, yeah, I guess you'll get my opinion later in the show, what it, my views are. All right. So what we'll do is we'll do a track by track. Um, we'll just talk about the songs that we like uh, or don't like um, and just give our opinions. Why don't we start off with Crying in the Rain? So that's the, uh, we're talking about the US track listing, which is very different to the UK track listing. So, John, what's your views of this song? Oh, I love Crying in the Rain. Um, I I couldn't wait to get the uh, the copy of Guitar for the Practicing Musician when they transcribed that song. And I could start learning that solo uh, that John Sykes does, that ridiculous over the top. I couldn't even play that fast, but yet I did my best to try <laughs> to try to learn it. Uh, I just, I love it. It's just, you're right. It's just, it just bludgeons you with how heavy it is. Coverdale's vocals are just ridiculous on that song. Um, I, you know, I love the low peaks. I love the soaring highs he does. Again, John Sykes is just a beast on that song. Uh, Ainsley Dunbar and Neil Murray, um, fantastic um, rhythm section behind it. Uh, I would come to find out it was a, a, a kind of a redone version of, a, of, of the song previous. I don't remember which album it's originally on, but um, but I know it was uh, I know it was a, a, an older song. So uh, yeah, I. I I was listening to it in the car. Uh, I was running an errand today and I just popped it in. I started listening to it. And all of a sudden I was like transformed back to being 17, 18 years old when I first got that album and I'm listening to it in the car. And all of a sudden I'm just like, you know, I'm just singing at the top of my lungs. I completely forgot the reason why I wanted to listen to it. I just became that kid again. So yeah, I love crying in the rain. Great song. Probably, nice my, fav- probably, my, probably my favorite off the album, actually. Yeah. Nice, nice take. Reed. Okay, uh, Crying in the Rain, also my favorite song on the album. And uh, I want to say up front, this is an album. There is so much information out there. There are so many stories and so many versions of every story. And I just want to make it plain, I am not a deep expert on this album. Uh, I read Martin Popoff's book on Whitesnake. It's fantastic. I've read articles about uh, about the album. I've listened to interviews. But you know what? I don't memorize all that stuff. So I'm not going to try and get into the trivia of it. But um, I think most Whitesnake fans will know, as John said, uh, Crying in the Rains, a redo of a song from 1982's Saints and Sinners, arguably my favorite Whitesnake album. Um, and the idea is when... Geffen wanted Coverdale to re-record Here I Go Again. He negotiated to put Cry in the Rain on the album. I think it is David Coverdale planting a flag into the hair metal era. So the biggest bands in rock at this point were your Poisons, uh, your Motley Crues. In fact, Whitesnake originally opened for Motley Crue on the Girls, Girls, Girls tour for this album. So they were not, you know, it was just a very short period of time where Whitesnake went from opening act to nation dominating headliner on this album. And it still has blues elements, which I find absolutely uh, essential for the Whitesnake sound. David Coverdale, however, has never been so over-processed. Uh, the 1987 album, it's just easier to refer to that than call it Whitesnake even though technically the album is simply White Snake. Um, it is one of the most overproduced albums <laughs> of the 80s. In fact, I put it up with David Bowie's Tonight uh, on the maximum input in the studio. There's so much reverb. There's so many overdubs. Um, John Sykes apparently took weeks getting his guitar sound together. Uh, and in fact, they had to bring in Rob Rock as an engineer just to get his guitar sound. He had so many, there's like an Eventide harmonizer and he's in wide stereo space. 
And there's this great story. I said I wasn't deep into the trivia, but some of the guitar stuff sticks with me where they needed some overdubs, just like really simple, like eighth note parts. And Sykes was like, well, I can't do it unless you set my whole setup up again. And they went, screw that. And they called in Dan Huff, who did it in 15 minutes. Um, so the album is just so overproduced. It's so over the top. And you really get that right off the bat in this song because Coverdale, his vocal is so much echo. There's so many bum, 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 reverb on it. And then, of course, Sykes's solos. And this is why I call it the Look at Me album, right? Because Coverdale is singing his butt off. And then you get to the solo and Sykes is so over the top. He is all over the freaking place. On the one hand, it's cool because, wow, what a hot shot guitarist. And I think he was really stepping up and saying, look, I can compete with any guitar hero on the market. On the other hand, we can't talk about Sykes without talking about what Tim beautifully dubbed in a previous video, The Wind Up. So I was waiting for that. As yeah. I was going through this album, I counted the windups on every song. <laughs> every song. You made a now, drinking game from it, right? Oh no, I'd be dead. <laughs> if if you don't believe me, listen to it with really good headphones. The windups are not always at the same uh, um, loudness level. Sometimes they're even back in the mix. But on this song, he does the wind up eight times. There are eight of them on this track. Uh, for that, all of that, I think it's a fantastic song. Again, because it's still bluesy. There's, you'll notice the first thing you get, da -na -na, this is blues, right? No wind up. He opens the next song with a wind up. We'll get there. Uh, and then David Coverdale singing naked, as naked as you could be with so much reverb and overdubs. So it's guitar singing, guitar singing. Um, again, planting a flag. They're still holding up the blues, but showing the kids, by which I mean the poisons and Motley Crues of the world, we still do it better than you. Well, Tim, what do you say to that? The, the wind. Th thanks, Reed, for that. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to get that patented, the John Sykes wind up. Say, so starting a chainsaw or a lawnmower. Um, but it doesn't take long in crying in the rain for it to come in, for the first one to come in. If, if, if my ears are, are treating me right, uh, you know, man starts sweeping when he's sick and tired of life. Da, 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 room, da, 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 da. Like it's it's right, never far away from the John Sykes windup. Um, yeah, bad boys and children of the night practically start the same. But anyway, yeah. So bought the album having only heard. Well, still the night. Here I go again. Is this love? So a third of that version of the album didn't know a thing about. Well, no. Sorry, by the time I did buy that album, I did know a little bit about previous White Snake. I knew Slow and Easy, Love Ain't No Stranger, and the original Four for Your Loving. And once I saw the original version for Here I Go Again, which only stuck to me because I remember he said, like a hobo instead of like a drifter. So very, very few songs I'd actually heard from the, at this point. So I knew nothing about crying in the rain and it comes out of nowhere. And it's, yeah, it's those three quick guitar stabs. No, no instruments in the background. Coverdale singing by himself. Guitar stabs come back in and then we're off to the races. And it's like, it's got to be the heaviest blues song ever. And when, um, when Reed said there was a lot of information, I, I know what he's talking about. And, and I think Martin tried his best in that book called, what's it called? Sail Away to make some sense out of that. But, if you talk to Coverdale, if you talk to John Sykes, if you talk to Neil Murray, uh, you're going to get so many different versions of what actually happened. John Kalodner, anybody that was involved with that album. Uh, it was a Keith, Ol it's Keith Olson. Yeah, Keith Olson was one of the guys, and then Mike Stone. It would almost be interesting to break it down month by month, week by week, what actually happened. You know, when did Coverdale basically decide to change the band members you know when did sykes come storming in and coverdale wouldn't get out of his car you know all of that crazy stuff um it would be really interesting but i don't think we'll ever know exactly what happened and in many ways it just kind of adds to the mystique of it this out of nowhere group where we're not really sure who's in the band 
but you know, Coverdale is saying, just listen to it. And this is a great way to start, which the fact that on the UK version, it's the second to last track makes no sense whatsoever to me. This is an opening track. I love the, um, I love the keyboards in it. Um, it's sort of a majestic, just mirroring the guitar. That takes me right back to listening to that in head, with headphones. But I like the fact it's kind of a complicated song. Uh, not the original version. The original version is pretty straightforward, but they do some weird things where they add a beat in. You know, when it first picks up, dun, 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 dun. like it's, it's not in 4-4. I've, I've listened to it. Like, I can't tell. I think it's in 12 8. Yeah, I think it's it's really it's really complicated. Then you get to the solo, which is practically there's a drum solo going on underneath the guitar solo. And and yeah, like Sykes was a ripper. Like he he was a shredder. Um almost so fast that you can't pick out the notes. Never mind trying to figure out how to play it. Um it's an epic, epic blues track and it just, I was in for a ride. I knew I was in for a ride. It was just such a treat to have, you know, when you're a kid, you get an album, you're kind of waiting for the songs you know. You're, maybe you're not really paying attention. This song demanded attention. And so I listened and I listened well. That's mm-hmm. my thoughts on Crying in the Rain. Sorry about that, lads. Um, I actually have the White Snake Anthology uh, guitar tab and um, the keyboards, and it's in 12.8. There you go. There you go. Way to go, John. Well done. I told you I, I, told you I studied that song to, to try to learn the solo. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've got a lot of the, the same feelings about this song that everyone has. Um, I'm, I was used to the, the, the version, which is a very atmospheric, bluesy version, you know, with Bernie Marsden. And I love Bernie Marsden. Great tone, full of drama. Um, but... David Coverdale has been on record to say that um, he found, although he loved that classic lineup, he found that there were limitations sonically. He wanted to take it to that next level. And I guess when you had a blues, bluesy hard rock band in the mid 80s, and you had a lot of these, um, you know, hair metal bands that were kind of very electric and there was a lot of shredding, he to conquer the North American market, he had to have cut through. And that's why he needed a player like John Sykes to to give him that necessary um, cut through into that sort of market. It's night and day um, comparing the two versions of the song. And I think that um, one thing, you know, I want to talk about uh, Crying in the Rain is the the drumming of Ansley Dunbar. It's, It's absolutely phenomenal. I don't like the mix of this album, and we'll talk more about this as we go. But, I, you know, I can still appreciate that Ansley Dunbar is working his ass off. And I know that Whitesnake um, literally auditioned about 200 drummers and it was getting really desperate and they were running out of money. And whoever came up with the idea of Ansley Dunbar was inspired because his drumming throughout this album is phenomenal, even though the production doesn't keep up with it and doesn't really highlight um, sonically, you know, how good it is, his drumming was. Um, But in respect to this song, I think that John Sykes solo is just fantastic. Um, It's just outer-worldly. It's the climax of the song. And, you know, I know Reezy said his guitar playing is over the top. I can accept it in the parameters of this album and that particular song. Maybe on Blue Murder, it's more overtly over the top and maybe detracts with the material. But in 1987, I think it fits the material. And for that particular time, one of my favourite on the album, and I love it a lot. Um, Yeah. All right. Next one is Bad Boys. Over to you, John. What do you think? Yeah, you know, to me, uh, Bad Boys just another. Just it follows that kind of that bludgeoning feeling of that you get with Crying in the Rain. This one's a little more straightforward, I believe. But again, it's just it's just so in your face. You got that, the, like you said, you, you got the Sykes uh, startup thing. I, I that that's that's great. I, I love that. Uh, I mean, lyrically, I think uh, it just spoke to where I was at the time. 
And I think that just, uh, you know, it was like a, it was like a battle cry. So, uh, and it was a great song to listen to in the car. So I, I always, I always, I always like bad boys. Uh, again, maybe, maybe a little, I don't know, maybe not quite, I wouldn't say quite filler. It's we're not quite to filler territory with with the album yet, but it's I think it was still a strong enough song. So uh, that's that's pretty much all I got about Bad Boys. I think it's I think it's a good song, good a good battle cry for for the teenage years in me at the time. So cool, great. All right, Bad Boys is an interesting one on several levels. First, uh, it reminds me so much of Scorpions, Bad Boys Running Wild from Love at First Sting, which was 1984. Um, I mean, thematically, it's the same song, right? Uh, of course, the Scorpions, excuse me, Scorpions track did not open with, which is exactly how this one opens. Um, and when I, I actually, when I listened to this album, I switched the order and put Bad Boys as the first track and Crying in the Rain is the second track. Now, for me, opening the track with the, the John Sykes, or opening the album with the John Sykes windup, and then you go into the second song where you've got guitar, vocal, guitar, vocal, is actually more powerful, but your mileage may vary. Um, and interesting, Peter, I have exactly the opposite feeling. I think that uh, Sykes' is Over the Top Plane fits Blue Murder because it was his vehicle. Whereas on these first three songs, I think his playing stands out so far from the rest of the song. But that's also what makes it the power section, right? These first three songs are why uh, 1987 has crossover appeal to heavy metal fans. Because they are so fast, they are so aggressive, and they have those over-the-top guitar solos, which were so atypical of bluesy white snake. So you've really got two bands in one band. You've got David Coverdale and his, I really wish I could still make money singing the blues persona. And you've got John Sykes pushing it into crossover with heavy metal, which was what was commercial at the time. Um, not their idea, of course. That was John Kolodner, the infamous AOR guru pushing them to do that sort of material. And you have to admit, for all that he screwed up Aerosmith, Kolodner knew what sold. And uh, he has even said in interviews that if David Coverdale had simply listened to him and put out more power ballads, that White Snake would have stayed on top, just like Aerosmith did. Think about that for a bit. Um, I prefer not to. Yeah, the uh, one one thing that I think immediately when listening to this song is there are so many layers of guitar, layers and layers and layers, that if they had gone into the concerts uh, or the tour. With only one player, it would have sounded terrible. So they needed a two guitar, at least a two guitar mix. Uh, and by the way, uh, wind ups on this six. So actually, not as many as "Crying in the Rain," uh, but they're much more prominent. And again, it opens. The solo starts with one, and then the solo ends with one. So um, now I did not count. I also, as I was listening to this, he has four primary things. He's got the wind-up, he's got pick squeals, he does them just as much as Zach Wilde, although he doesn't get nearly the dirt for it that Zach Wilde does. He's got pick slides. Now, the wind-up is up and down. The power slide is just down the string. Uh, I wanted to count all three of those, and there's just so much of it going on constantly, it was impossible, and I didn't want to have to listen to every song four times in preparation for, uh, for this chat. But just keep that in mind when you're listening to it. The other, of course, is his vibrato, which we'll get to later. Uh, and it's, I think, the thing that makes John Sykes one of the best guitar players to come out of the 80s. Um, yeah, yeah, that's really it. I like it. I, I don't think it's as good as the song before it or after it. I do think it would have been a better opening track. Uh, I think the solo is, yeah, it doesn't fit. But uh, all on the whole, I think it's a great song. And it still is maintaining the power section, those first three songs that really grab you. Thanks, Reid. And um, on this clip, I'll put a little tally that will scroll over with the pick squeals and the, uh, the, the, the John Sykes wind-ups as we go along the albums. Tim. The other thing that Sykes does is these, oh, these big bends, like almost over bends. Like, you know, he'll bend like two steps up. He does that in this solo. 
not whammy bar stuff. I mean, there's whammy bar stuff, but this is different. This is him like bending up, not just to the next. I'm getting real technical. I don't know how to bet, but it's over bending. Mm -hmm. But he always resolves to the right now. It's all over the blue murder stuff too. If you were to read the tab, you'd see it go like this and this. And hopefully, hopefully I'm explaining that uh, correctly. And Bad hope you don't break okay. a string from, and hope you don't break a string when you're playing it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Try that in the clubs when you've got one guitar. <laughs> and yeah, one guitar in that lineup, it wouldn't have sounded right. It, the, during the solos, it would have dropped right out. Even with even if you had a keyboard player with the bass, at least you'd have a little bit more going on sonically. But yeah, Coverdale was right to have two guitar players. But the trouble is, is that back in those days, he he tended to pick guitar players that would agree to play with them. And then they tell him later, oh, I only played, I don't play with other guitar players. That's another story. Um, this, this song I loved from the first time I heard it, but it took on new meaning uh, five years ago when the one time I did get to see White Sing in concert. I know I've told this story before on several channels. I think that, uh, I think I talked about it with Peter before when we were talking about White Snake. We've talked about White Snake and John Sykes a lot, but when I saw White Snake in concert, um, opening for Foreigner, they opened with Bad Boys. And, you know, my wife came with me um, and, you know, she liked the show. She she didn't know a lot of White Snake songs, certainly not the non-singles, right, um, for the most part, or how they went. So they start playing the riff to Bad Boys and out of nowhere, I'm, I go, ow, ow, ow. Like <laughs> at the beginning of the song, and she laughed because there were two people next to me that did the same thing. It's like, yeah, that's supposed to be there. I didn't just turn all of a sudden. I just turned into a werewolf all of a sudden. So I, I can't help but think of that now. Love the double bass as the song fades out. Undercover the moonlight. Yeah, Ainsley is a monster on this album. I mean, yes, you know, I mean, I've said many times I'm a huge fan of the early Journey stuff, and 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 he can handle playing in odd time signatures, no problem. But yeah. Um, so not only, like uh, Reed said, is there a lot of information about the making of this album, there's a lot of sonic information when you're listening to this. doesn't matter what song it is. There's an awful lot to process. And I like the way that, that Peter put it, is that the, the production can't keep up with the drum performance. You know, when, when Ainsley goes into a big fill, it's, it's like a big thunderclap. You can't really hear what he's doing. Um, they if they could have just backed off that reverb, reverb just just to touch um i didn't think anything of it when i first heard it it didn't occur to me when i was 12 years old that you couldn't like the production of an album that you liked the songs on it didn't occur to me that you could listen to it in that way and think they should have done this it was like well i'm not them they know better than me but the production is absolutely smothering on this album i think that it did the trick for the time because I think they wanted um, radio stations to put this on and just have it overload and be the loudest thing on the radio. And I think they wanted something that would sound really good in crappy car stereo speakers. So they succeeded on that level, but to listen to it now, you know, this many years later, yeah, dial back some of the reverb, dial back some of the, the, the guitar effects. You'd still have a great album. But yeah, Bad Boys, I mean, you know, we're off to we're off to a good start now. And I like that song. And, you know, there's a comfort in knowing, well, I know the next two songs. So I, I now know half of this album as I'm listening to it for the first time. Nice. Thank you. Um, I guess when I heard Bad Boys um, for the first time, the thing that hit me was the lyrics. It was completely different to the sort of template of lyrics, uh, like Walking in the Shadow of the Blues. I think that um coverdale may have dumbed down his lyrics a little bit like i know you you know me i'm the black sheep of the family so even in the day through 1987 years i thought oh it's a little bit cheesy but um look i have to admit david coverdale is not the shakespeare of uh lyric writers but i have grown uh, accustomed to it and i accept it and you know for it does fit the song it's it's a fun song when I see this song played live, I always hear the uh, where it changes in, are you ready to rock? You know, where it does the chugga chugga and it goes, are you ready yeah. to rock? And then it goes into another song and then it comes back. 
So it's very hard to listen to this song and not, sort of uh, separate it from the, the live experience. I don't mind that it's track number two. There are so many hits on that first side. I mean, when you're going to turn the the record over, it, it's going to weigh down your, <laughs> your you know your turntable because it's just. I think this was in 1987. This was the era that they just front end loaded all the hits, all the major songs. And when we get into side two, you'll see that um, you know maybe the material's not quite as strong. Um, but bad boy fits. I think it's 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 um, thematically it it sort of fits in with you know between crying in the rain and still of the night. And um, Neil Murray, his bass playing is fantastic on this album. Now Neil Murray. When he was playing the bass, he played um, sonically very back in the mix in the, the White Snake classic era. You know, he'd be very close to Pacey on the drums and, um, you know, very understated. But he has to change his bass playing to suit the 1980s, you know, hair metal or shredding metal um, of that era. So it's way up in the mix. And it just shows, you know, how versatile Neil Murray as, as a bass player. So it's a bit of a head scratcher. We'll talk more about that, why he was fired or, or let go, um, because I could sort of see that he would have fit in to that touring band um, like, like a glove. But, um, yeah, bad boys, um, cheesy lyrics aside, I think it's, it's great. And, um, I don't have an issue with it. Um, I think it fits into side one in the set list or the, the song list, um, quite nicely. All right. Here's the big, one of the big songs on the album, JC, Still of the Night. Yep. That's probably my second favorite track on the album. Um, golly, uh, the riff. That 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 why that wind up riff, you know the vocals, the groove, the as Reed mentioned earlier, the little all the different atmospheres this song takes on. When you have that nice long keyboard break with the the you know the moody, ready for sex Coverdale voice that he's got going on, and you know, but and then you get that and you get that and then the a flurry, a flurry of notes from Sykes. I uh, second favorite song. There's, I could. There's no way I could uh, do it justice. It's just to me. It's just a. Uh, it's just a fantastic song to listen to, and uh, just again, you. There's just so much going on in the song because of all the production. Like you guys have been saying, it's just. It's it's always going to be my second favorite song on the album, though. That that's all I've got with that one. It's just I mean, it's just blowing, mind blowing. I think you like it. Read. Yeah. All right. So certainly for heavy metal fans, still of the night is the glorious burden of this album. Uh, that that riff is unquestionably one of the top riffs from the 1980s. It's just incredible. Now, that saying, it was not a huge hit. It only hit number 79 on the top 100. So it was not even a top 40 song. Uh, they would get much greater commercial success with later songs. And I think that was very typical of the day uh, that you've got, they come out first with this just in your face ass kicker of a song so that it grabs your attention and it gets all the hard rock, gets the guys excited. And then they come out with the power ballad so that you bring the women on board. And I know guys can like power ballads and women can like powerful songs, but this was the 80s. And that was our defined role. Um, now, that said, with time, this is the song that disappoints me the most because of the production. There's so much of it. Um, I don't like the Led Zeppelin-esque digression in the middle of it. I just don't like it. It's useless. It does nothing for me. It, it's just like, it reminds me of when Ozzy Osbourne did No More Tears. And there's that long, it's just a hand in the bush part before they get into the guitar solo. I'm like, take that out of there. Just go from verse to, you can have a, a little bit of a bridge and then let him hit the solo. Except in this case, when we hit the solo, it's one of the most amazing pieces of over-the-top shredding from the 80s, and you can't freaking hear it. It's so buried in harmonizer and reverb. Now, 
I almost never pay attention to reissues, re-releases, remixes. But if you get the remixed, the recently remixed versions of albums, like I got, I think it's, he did the red, white, and blues albums. And I think this song is on the white album where, uh, and I know he then re-released 1987. And I was like, screw you. I already paid for one reissue. I'm not buying multiple reissues. But uh, where they dial that reverb back and you can hear the guitar and it improves the song a hundred percent, in my opinion. So uh, this is one case where I'm like, yeah, take a little bit of the 80s off of the song and you get a much better product. I think the song needed editing, but each of the individual parts of it are absolutely astounding. And again, it's not all Sykes. Coverdale is still turning in the best vocal performance he ever did. Uh, as much as I like the bluesy White Snake, uh, he outsings bluesy David Coverdale by a country mile on this album. Oh, uh, and sorry, I'm letting down the side here. Uh, wind ups on Still of the Night. Anybody want to guess? Oh, I guess the length of the song would be a lot. Well, I'll just yeah. tell you, it's six. It's sixteen <laughs> by wow. far. The most of any track on the album. Okay. Well, there's two before the vocal starts. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> All right, Tim. <laughs> um, That'll this is do something me. else I just recently got was the uh, the single to "Still of the Night." So nice. I've single. got I've got the 12 inch of that one. What's on yeah, the um, uh, on the B side? Just incidentally, it's actually got "Here I Go Again" '87. Now I don't know if that means that's the wimpy mix that comes right in with the whole band which i've never yeah. liked but anyway um yeah i'll have to i'll have to dig the turntable out and listen to it but yeah anyway yeah this this is a song that like it doesn't really matter how many times i've heard it i get sucked right into it way back to 1987 it's such an epic in scope track even though it's just another coverdale sex lyric it is clothed in this epic of a rock song now I knew I had heard the the name Led Zeppelin at this point. I didn't know anything about them. Quite honestly, I used to get really annoyed when people would talk about, oh, they're ripping off Led Zeppelin. Not just them, but you know, Great White, Kingdom Come, you name it. Because the only thing I ever heard from Led Zeppelin um, was the BBC version of Dazed and Confused with 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 Page on the bow, and it it just sounded like a big racket to me. I'm like, I this doesn't sound at all like. I understood years later, especially when I heard Black Dog. I'm like, okay, okay. But it doesn't matter because Coverdale is still, it, yeah, it's it's one of not just his best vocal performances. It is like, it's a master class in, because he, he proves he can sing well in a lower key, in a medium key, and he can hit the highest of highs. Um, I love the middle section, you know, when the, when the you know, the foe, strings come in i love the harmonics on the guitar the dun, 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 like and that's headphone stuff that's you know when it's a quiet arrangement like that the production i don't think is that bad because there's not quite as much going on you know you've got the you've got the bass going, but you know it's just it's building it's building and uh oh man the, the solo is epic but it, you only hear certain parts of it because it is, well, the rhythm guitars are, I think that when the, when the lead comes in, the rhythm guitar should have been dialed back a bit because they're fighting for the same space in the mix. But you just kind of get the idea that something really cool is happening here in the background, even though you can't make it out. Um, yeah, it, it's, it really doesn't matter how many times I've heard it. it. This is a song that probably more than other takes me back. As far as its chart position go goes, I think this is another smart move on Collodner's part, Geffen's part. There's no way a song like this that was this heavy was going to get on top 40 airwaves, even though bands had made inroads like Def Leppard and stuff like that. But they weren't doing it with songs like this. What this song did was kick the door open. This started a ground, like a groundswell of people buying buying this album may you know i'm thinking maybe by the time here i go again came out it might have been at plat single platinum status i don't know but still the night would have brought it to gold 
you'd have that many heavy rock fans that heard this song, saw the video on Headbangers Ball, or heard it on Metal Shop. I used to love Metal Shop, the only show with teeth, um, and said, this is awesome. I want this in my collection. I'm buying it. And it was it, it kicked open the door. And this was the smart thing that these labels did. They, they, they'd kick open the door, and then you'd release songs that had a more wider appeal. Eventually, of course, when, when the labels got more and more desperate, when grunge was happening, the first single would be a ballad. But I digress. Still the night. Still an epic song. Uh, I think it's held up. And yeah, the production is still smothering. But for the for this, you know, six and a half, seven minutes, I can overlook it because I'm I'm right there listening to it again. Because it's one thing to see the video or hear it on the radio, but when you've actually bought the album and you listen to it with headphones and you really hear the song, yeah, it's uh it's definitely one of the most epic hard rock songs of the eighties by anybody. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Well, I think this is one of White Snake's greatest songs, bar none. It's if they didn't play this live, there would be a riot in the audience. It is um, one of their signature songs. There's just so much drama in the song. And Reed, um, I, I probably sort of disagree. I, I I can understand where you're coming in regards to the production side, but the arrangements, I wouldn't change a thing. Even when I heard it in the day, I knew it was ripping off Led Zeppelin. But hey it adds to the drama of the song. I just think every the way it's arranged and sequenced, it's perfect. It builds up to the drama. And that that John Sykes uh, guitar solo, it's probably one of my favourite solos of all time of any guitarist. Whether it's shredding over the top, I don't know, but it just adds to the song. I never get sick of this song. It gives a shiver up my spine and... I love the video clip, even though in these days it's a little bit stalkerish. It, it's not very politically correct. But, um, you know, when you look at that video and every band member in that particular video did not play on this album, that's something that really screwed a lot of people's minds up. That really put the mark of White Snake um, in America. And I think it was very smart of John uh, Colander to basically do a hard rock song is number one, power ballad is number two, and a ballad number three. Punch, punch, punch. And that's why I think commercially this album has generated so many unit sales. I think he was very smart. I think if they did it the other way around, the ballad, then people wouldn't have bought into it. The hard rock is the people that like it because there's a lot of teeth on this album. And if you just put out Is This Love, then I don't think people would have bought it. Back to the song. So David Coverdale with his vocals. David Coverdale in 1982 would not have had the range to sing this song. David Coverdale in 1986 and maybe 1985 had bad sinus infection that was affecting his vocals. He was actually on the ropes and he had to have this groundbreaking surgery to cure this, this sinus infection. And that was affecting the whole recording of this album. The budget was being blown out. David Coverdale was on the skins of his ass. He basically, he, in many interviews, he said he only had 10 cents in his wallet. He was singing for um, commercials and jingles. He was, you know, um, sort of couch surfing. This is David Coverdale. He was basically back to the wall. I've heard a lot of demos of David Coverdale doing uh, tracking vocals for this particular song and they're a bit out of tune. When he had the operation, he was very gun shy to actually do vocals in the booth for a lot of 1987, and Still of the Night was one of those songs. So he actually had to be pushed. He was pushed, he was pushed, and eventually he was able to put a vocal that I agree with you, Reed, is probably one of the greatest David Coverdale vocals of all time. However, I think my theory is this sinus operation opened up a whole new range to his vocals, which was completely different to that bluesy, deep reach vocals of David Coverdale in the 70s and early 80s. So I think that sinus operation was the, the watermark, pre-operation, post-operation, the tone, his vocal chops completely changed. You never got that sort of deep, rich, bluesy David Coverdale of the 70s and 80s that was gone. 
But what we got is probably one of, yeah, as I said, it's a great song, really smart that um, this was the lead single off, off this this album. Um, anyway, I, I think we could do a whole show on, on Still of the Night, um, but um, got to keep things moving along. We'll, um, here I go again. Over to so, you, JC. So I just got to say, 80s metal, politically correct? I don't think any 80s metal is politically correct, personally. But anyway, yeah, here I go again. So you uh, another redone song from a previous album, the Saints and Sinners uh, album, as I had to check that one again. So um, I, not quite a smothering of production from my recollection from hearing this again, mainly because I think uh here again they tone it down a lot more with the sound you have you have adrian vanberg on the guitar solo instead i don't know if sykes even plays on the song but uh um just a tasty i think a tasty version uh, i like i like the version i think on this album a little maybe a little because i have heard the original and i think i like this version on this better um it it wasn't a it it wasn't a song that made me go running away in the night because power ballad power ballads and ballads tended to make me do that back in the day. Um, but I again I think it was another song I just connected with. Um lyrically, it just it just it just hit me where I was at the time. And as soon as the song started up and playing it, playing it again, I was like, yep, picked right up on it. So um again, tasty solo from from Adrian Vanberg. Um Again, I think a very well done, nice, nice, uh, nice closing to the to side A. Okay, thank you. And Reed. So yeah, back in the day, I have two very different experiences with this album. Kind of like uh, John was saying, for me, as soon as "Still of the Night" ends, and this song opens up with "Dee." I would turn off the cassette and never listen to the rest of the album. So for a long time, I listened to exactly three songs off of this album. It took me until, oh, the 2000s when I stopped being so hardcore about my metal that I was finally able to accept some of the rest of the music on the album. I still think that the following tracks, the, the next three tracks, although they are unquestionably the most popular tracks and some of them the most popular rock songs of the 80s are the weakest tracks on the album. I call this the AOR hits section. John's exactly right that all of them are sonically different. The guitar is dialed back. The keyboards are way up. They're way more prominent in the mix. Um, even if you've no idea who Adrian Vandenberg is, when you hear the guitar solo in this, you'll go, that wasn't the same guy. It's not the same guy who just played those other three. And I think it's a fantastic solo um, because it fits the song. John Sykes' solos on those first three tracks, again, they're amazing solos, but they are John screaming, look at me, at the top of his lungs with his guitar. Adrian's not that player. He can be, but he's not. Um, and he fits in with a, a very tasty solo. And people use that, that term. I hear guitar players say, oh, that was tasty. Because it fits in with the rest of the song, right? Um, and the, the entire production style of the album changes. The vocal sound changes. The guitar sound changes. It's like listening to a separate album for the next three tracks. Um, and... This song is functionally identical to Love Ain't No Stranger off of Slide It In, which is a big, David Coverdale starts repeating himself. I mean, clearly he's got two previous tracks on the album. Now, one of them was Geffen's idea. This one, in fact, was Geffen's idea to redo. But we're going to start seeing David reusing ideas a lot. It's more excusable, I think, in the grand scheme of things, because for all intents and purposes, 1987 was Whitesnake's first album for most Americans. Slide It In just did not sell a lot of copies. So, and again, the, the originals were imports. So this was the first album of Whitesnake that most Americans had heard. And uh, that gives you a bit of license, I think, to repeat yourself, except if you're a deep fan, 
and you go in and, and you listen to the other stuff, you're like, wait, haven't I heard this song before someplace? Um, so, yeah, I have grown to accept it. I think it's okay and no better than okay. And I don't understand why it went to number one. It was a massively popular song. It was their biggest hit ever. Um, and I don't understand that. But so be it. The rest of the world has spoken. It was, uh, let's hear, VHS, excuse me, VH1, the, the channel VH1 in 2006, called this number 17 of all of the rock songs of the 1980s, the 17th best rock song in the 1980s. Again, I don't get it. It's fine. It's fine. But this yeah. whole section, and by the way, you're going to see a theme here. Um, Wind-ups, zero. Um, beat, John, beat Sykes, John Sykes is just not engaged in these next three songs on the same level. Yeah, controversial as always, Reid. Tim? Well, what, what more is there to say? Well, here I go again. I mean, it's pop culture. It's bigger than the band. It's a song that more people know who th the song than probably know who it is. Like, if you guys remember back in the file sharing days, you know, people probably thought this was Def Leppard or it was Guns N' Roses. They, you know, you just, they'd call it anything because it was the Wild West, right? Bottom line is people knew the song. And it is funny to me that... Um, yeah, I mean, it was as huge as it could get. It went to number one. It was a number one pop hit. I think it was just, well, I mean, obviously it was a combination of the video, which has nothing to do with the song at all. Makes no sense whatsoever. I think it was just the right song at the right time. It was the summertime. Uh, it was a feel-good anthem. And it kind of combined. I've never considered it a power ballad, although it certainly starts out like one. But when the chorus hits, it's it is more of an anthem. It's more of a you know something that might have ended up on a soundtrack. Uh, yeah, I mean it's like I said, it's 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 in. I've heard it so many times, um, and I do like once in a while to listen to that original version on Saints and Sinners as sort of a palate cleanser because it's the same essence of the song is there. That's why I really hate that 1987 remix, the one that wasn't on the album. And like I said, just comes in with the full band. To me, that's ignoring the dynamics of the song. If you hear the 1982 version, you might either think it's another band, um, but it's the same arrangement. It starts off just vocal and keyboards, so it doesn't ignore the arrangement. But anyway, um, just to clarify, I certainly wasn't around at the time, but the early White Snake albums did come out in Canada and the States. They just weren't very widely distributed. The uh, so you had Snake Bite, Trouble, and Love Hunter on United Artists Records, really hard to find. And then this label called Mirage that was distributed by Atlantic did Ready and Willing, Live in the Heart of the City, Come and Get It. Now, interestingly, and I've never seen any evidence to the contrary, I don't think Saints and Sinners ever came out in Canada or the U.S., um, prior to the Geffen reissues in 1987. And that's all the more reason why it was safe to redo not one, but two songs from that album and put it on this 1987 album, because you're right. And calling the album, just calling it White Snake is a clever way of rebranding and introducing yourself as a new band. Although anybody with half a brain would take one look at the guys in the band and know these are not young guys in their early twenties. You know, they were old, don't get me wrong, but, you know, and Tommy Aldridge always looked old. Anyway, uh, that's another thing. Neil Murray, I think, I think, the think was it, I think Peter, you said Neil Murray would have fit right in image wise. He looked like the rest of them did. He didn't, he didn't look like Mickey Moody or Bernie Marston. I love those guys too. And Ainsley Dunbar wouldn't have looked any older than Tommy Aldridge, but anyway, Tommy's a monster. He's, he's awesome. But so here I go again. Um, I don't really know what more to say about it. I do think the only thing I can think of is why it was such a big hit was that it was just the right song at the right time. It hit that nerve of people that wanted something that was poppy, but a little bit more guitar. I agree. Big fan of Adrian Vandenberg. The solo is perfect. It's got a little fast climbing look in it, but it's not over the top. I think Jake John Sykes does play the, the rest of the guitars on it. 
which there's no windups in it. There's not really a place for windups, but he would put windups in even if there wasn't a place for it. Um, you know, it, it's a it's a classic song that will outlive us all. And I don't really know what more I can say about it. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Well, I agree. I think everyone has um, spoken very eloquently about this this song. Um, I think it's their um, White Snake's My Way. It's what Frank Sinatra had with My Way. I think this is the White Snake My Way. Um, I think it's an emotionally affecting song. It's The chorus is very punchy. You can sort of see why it's like a, the sugar hit that radio would have enjoyed in 1987. I'm going to put it out to all of you on this um, on this uh, this show. Do you think Tawny Katane has got a big reason for this song to go to number one with that video? I mean, the video, as you, um, I think JC, you said, had nothing to do with the the lyrics, but. Um, Tony Contain doing the cartwheels on the on the the jag. If there was, a, if it was a different video, would it have been as successful? What do you think? No, I mean, nineteen eighty seven. You cannot underestimate the impact on American sales of video, and that video. You know, I think Tim's right. It was the perfect woman on the perfect car at the perfect time. It was hitting you know, the right demographic, all of the uh, teenage boys were like, yep, need some of that in multiple senses of the word. Mm. Um, yeah, that video was stupidly popular. Uh, yeah. You say, yes, it, it unquestionably is a huge factor. Absolutely. And when, I mean, the lyrics are quite deep and meaningful and emotional and, you know, they've been in, in jingles, it's been in commercials, Um the, the video is kind of a little bit more um, at polar odds with, with the, the lyrical emotion, it, it, you know, when you've got um, Tawny doing this Paula Abdul um, dance routines. It, it just, it, yeah, it's a bit of a head scratch, but it certainly did a lot to the sales of this song. Look, um, Bernie Marsden's very happy about the royalties. <laughs> I think that's, um, I, I see a lot of Facebook media posts and um, he, he looks quite chuffed um, to, to be uh, the songwriting credits. I think this is the one that really um, has populated the David Coverdale money bank. It, um, you know, um, I, I think he gets a nice royalty check. Look, Tim, I agree with you. It's going to outlast us. It's, it's just um, the song that hit the right spot in 1987 and um i think the, the you know the production the arrangements and it really spoke to to the masses and it went to number one and you just can't deny it so all right well there we go that's side one heavy put the record over Ooh. we start off with give me all your love what do you think of this jc again i think not a bad track to start this to start the side off um you know again lyrically maybe nothing uh you know definitely typical of what was coming out in the 80s i think at that time so i don't think lyrically it was breaking any ground um i think it was just a it was just a strong energetic opener you, you needed something to kind of you know pick you pick you up after after the after here I go again if you wanted to get back into something kind of heavy so uh and while it it's not as heavy as say as crying in the rain or bad boys it's still a it's still a pretty decent chugger um again lyrically nothing fancy just uh pretty much a straightforward anything you could hear in the 80s at that time but Meat and potatoes uh, Pretty much meat and potatoes, yeah. Uh, but I do want to go back to to uh, to the video for "Here I Go Again." It was Tawny's "Here I Am." Look at me. <laughs> That's that was the only I wanted to mention that with the video. But anyway, yeah, yeah. give me all I yeah, give me all your love. Yeah, I, just a good meat and potatoes opening side to side to album. So I yeah, I like it. It was good. Yeah, I don't have anything bad to say about it. Great. Okay. Um, why should I start caring about what people think of my opinions now? I think it's aggressively mediocre. Uh, in the 80s, I hated it. And now I'm fine with it, but no better than that. Um, it is obviously of the middle three, which are the AOR hit section. It is the song on which Sykes is the most involved. 
there's still not a single windup on this song. What he does have is a ton of pick squeals, but I decided if I started to count those that I had to go back and count them on the rest of the album and I would just lose what few marbles I had left. So, um, but just the fact that he does them means that he's more involved. And it's got that, again, just like the earlier tracks, a massively over the top solo. In fact, the solo does not fit with the song at all. That's a theme of when John Sykes is, is really feeling his oats on this album. He doesn't care what the rest of the song is doing. He's just giving it everything he can think of, which makes me think, now I have not checked it, but I suspect that this song was recorded or at least uh, written, arranged at basically the same time as the opening tracks. Because you get a different John here than you get on, here I go again, Jeez. Anyway, so Sykes is much more involved. David is singing meat and potatoes is a good way to put it. It's right in David's wheelhouse. It's nothing special. It's not as not as derivative as as the as some of the later stuff, but it's it's okay. It was a song that I think it was released as a single. It it wasn't as massively popular a single. They still do it in concert. It's one of those, he gets the choir going, right? Where he just holds out the microphone and you let the audience sing and they do that for 10 minutes. And frankly, I get really tired of that in concert. Um, but it's, it's okay, but it still is not as powerful as the songs in the power section to me. So it just, it slides by and I go on to the next track and we'll get there soon enough. Thanks, Ray. Tim. Um, so this song was the fourth single, and it's number 48, which is respectable, but it certainly wasn't one that was going to have a lot of, uh, you know, staying power on the radio. Um, it's a shuffle, and I don't know if that has something to do with... Actually, you know what? I think that might have something to do with the fact that there's no wind-ups on it, because that tempo doesn't lend itself to, you know, that it's got like a ZZ Top you know, kind of, kind of, uh, uh, shuffle feel to it, but yeah, lots of picks, pick slides. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those songs that, you know, lyrically, yeah, dog without a bone. I mean, it's classic, you know, Coverdale lyrics. It's, it's interesting that, you know, when you like the Led Zeppelin thing, hearing, hearing still the night before I heard anything from Led Zeppelin, um, a few years after this, I got into queen and when I first heard the song, Tie Your Mother Down, you know, where Freddie's like, all oh, your love tonight. And it's like, oh, that reminds me of White Snake. Of course, it came first. I don't know if that was a subconscious thing or not. That's just something I always noticed about it. Um, yeah, it, it just kind of is. There is one thing that I, I it's nothing to do with the version on the album. But we, ha we have been talking about Tani Katain on this Snakeskin Boots, which is from Tokyo, I think. Uh, from the tour for this album with the completely different lineup. The opening line, when I first saw you, Tani, you took my breath away. I said, oh, he didn't just say that, did he? <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, above all, it's a fun song, you know? Yeah. And I can see where it was poppy enough. Not only was it following on the heels of two big singles to, you know, hit the top 50, but, you know, it probably got a fair amount of radio play at the time. It wasn't as popular a video. It was just a live video. But, you know, um, respectable for single run from a very, very successful album. And, and it probably just kept that momentum going just a little bit. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Tim. Well, I think it's a bit of a filler track. I think as we go deeper into side two, there's a little bit of filler. Um, so... I don't think it's one of the strongest songs on the album. I think if Elvis Presley um, was fronting a heavy metal band, this would be thematically um, in the Elvis Presley wheelhouse. Um, and incidentally, what, what I forgot to talk about regarding Still of the Night, apparently Still of the Night, the uh, the chordal um, progressions are based on Jailhouse Rock. Um, so go figure. But um, yeah. Well, that stops the charts. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Coverdale uh, has always said that. Don't yeah, hear 
Yeah. And also it was based on a, a demo that he did with Richie Blackmore. So there's different stories out there. Again, 100 stories, only one's rule. Um, but give me all your love. I think it's a bit of a, a bit of a throwaway. I know it's uh, played in the um, the live set, um, but um, to me, it's not one of the, the strongest 1987 tracks. But um, I have this vision. Elvis Presley could could capably sing this song. Um, all right, another Uber hit um, on the classic uh, soft rock radio was "Is This Love," John Clauser. Yeah. Yeah. Does this pull your heartstrings? This ha- this song has this song has deep deep history with me. Um I can I can remember playing this for uh for a girl I was wanting to to date back in 1989. So between this and Save Your Love from uh from Great White, they those songs became quite infamous in our uh in our courtship at the time. But anyway, uh yeah, I just you know, tastier solo instead of this crazy shredding and you know he it fit this it actually kind of fit the song of uh, you know again you hear it you hear is this love and then you hear so many copycats after uh from so many other bands i think at after that you know i think there's a lot of bands that started kind of doing something similar um uh, yeah, again, I don't think there's a whole lot I can really say. It's it it was a it it has deep history with me. I, it's, it's a song I love to I love to sing when I hear it in the car or, or something along that line. And it just take again, it just takes me back to those days of of courtship with somebody. So, uh, um, yeah, I I it's been so long since I've seen the video. I don't even remember the video much anymore. But uh, and I know it was a popular one, but. Um, yeah, it just has it just has a it has a soft spot in my heart, but it's there's is it anything special? Not really. I mean, after that, because it's like I said, it just you it, it's it's almost like a dime a dozen kind of power rock ballad in my opinion. But uh, it does the lyrics the lyrics make it make it a little bit more meaningful for me. So yeah, uh, I appreciate that. Thanks, John. What about you, Reed? I feel no nostalgia for this song. I don't like it. Now, I recognize the artistry of it. And uh, David Coverdale has said in the, the liner notes of one of the many, many versions of this song that are out there that he wrote it for Tina Turner. And it makes perfect sense if you think about, you know, what's love got to do with it or some of the big, I mean, Tina Turner was huge in 1987. Yes. Um, so if you think about that style of song, yes, I can absolutely see Tina Turner doing it. It's a well-crafted song of that style. That is not my style of song. Um, and interesting that Geffen, uh, Geffen was given credit for talking Coverdale into keeping the song and putting it on this album. And it went to number two. So it's it's not it was not quite as popular as Here I Go Again, but that is really popular. Um, there are a lot of big bands out there that have never had a number one or number two hit. So I mean that's a massive song. That said, the only thing I like about it is uh, the John Sykes solo, and it is because it is the only solo he turns in on this entire album, which was written for the song. Now, clearly, he's got nothing else to do for the rest of the song. I mean, he's playing some rhythm, but the rhythm is so far back behind the keyboards. He's contributing nothing sonically until you get to the solo. And the solo is not just slower and melodic. He employs that massive vibrato. And if you go back and look at the guitar player magazines at the time, he was voted best vibrato in rock. And it's because of this song, because when you're playing 90 miles an hour, you can't vibrato anything. He's playing through his notes too quickly. But this song, I said that solo is beautiful. And I can just loop that solo and listen to it over and over again and go, man, when I think of taste, when I think of note choice and soulfulness, that was it. And I wish that John could have put his ego aside and put that part of his playing into the other songs even if it was this is okay this is why i like vivian campbell better than john sykes 
because Vivian breaks up his fast pieces with slower pieces, right? That's what defines the difference between the two. When John is playing fast, he is just pedal to the floor and he follows it to the end of the solo. Uh, whereas I would really have loved to hear him play a little more space. So I've got no use for this song. I wish Tina Turner had done it. It'd have been just as big a hit for her. Uh, it's not my style. And I would have preferred the album without it. I skip it every single time I listen to this album. Thanks, Reed. Tim. I, I couldn't agree more with Reed on the solo. It's so tasteful and so well done. And, uh, you know, he's got the, um, you know, the toggle switch back off. So it's not like high frequency. Yeah, it, you could sing the solo. It's very tasteful. Um, there's a lot that I can defend about this song. Um, yeah, huge hit. You forget how big this one was. Um, it doesn't get the play that Here I Go Again does. And I don't think it's as identifiable with the, identifiable with the band because it's that much less um, hard rock. But one of the things that separates it from a lot of the power ballads of the time is the vocal. It's really not an over-the-top vocal. Uh, it's very measured. There's not really any high vocal histrionics in it. You know, uh, yeah, it's a famous story, you know, it was supposedly written with Tina Turner in mind. But, you know, someone else I could hear singing this song would be Robert Palmer. It's got that same sort of baritone um, uh, feel to it, you know, maybe Paul Rogers, somebody like that. So, you know, this is not a song to compete with all the young bands out there. Uh, it's got more of, um, I don't know, vocally, it's got more of a 70s feel. You know, musically, it's all 80s. The video was another Tawny Katain, uh, you know, uh, escapade. But one of the odd things about the video that when I think about it, I, I picture Rudy Sarzo, with, who didn't play, of course, on the album, playing not just a, a little Steinberger bass, but a double neck Steinberger bass. And I never understood why. Why would you go through all the trouble to get such a unique instrument? And you're just miming a part in a video. I've never seen him play it live. I don't know if one of the necks was fretless. Maybe. Don't know. But um, I think it's a perfectly well-crafted song. I don't have any problem with it, but I mean, I'm a child of that era. Um, you know, I, I like the fact that Whitesnake had not, not this one, but two big hits. You can't take that away from him. Um, but it is different. It is different than your standard rope power ballad. It doesn't sound like Aerosmith Angel. You know, it, 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 it's, it's not, um, it's, it's definitely not run of the mill. Which is to say, it's not written like a hard rock ballad at all. It is written like an R and B song. So mm. that's that's my take on it. I, but by but you know by far the the crowning achievement in the song is Sykes' solo. And yes, he he's got great vibrato. He can be very tasteful. If he had channeled some of that energy into picking his spots when to play fast, to me he could have been in the same league as somebody like a Neil Sean, who can play blistering fast licks but always plays a melody that can be remembered. It's not one thing or another all the time. So yeah, I'm glad, I, I don't know what it was that, that convinced him to dial it back for this one, because it's undeniably Sykes too. That's another thing, you can just tell the tone. It's yes. him. Yes. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, they're another big hit. One of, you know, probably responsible for two, three million more albums sold. 100%. And uh, Reed, you forgot. Zero windups. Zero windups. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been so inappropriate. <laughs> I, I bet he put his hand up. Come on, just one, please. You listen to <laughs> as it fades out, maybe, you know, Coverdale's vamping in here. Oh, maybe there might be one right at the very bottom of the fade out. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it up. I, I'll, I'll, I'll investigate that, Tim. I'll investigate that. I'm like John. I've got some emotional connection. Um, with relationships, with my wife. Um, I like this song. This song is so outside my wheelhouse. This is not the sort of song or balladry that I, I, I normally uh, enjoy. I'm a bit of a rock guy. But there's something that pulls my heartstrings. It, whether it's a guilty pleasure or not, I think it it's emotionally affecting. And I think that Coverdale vocals are sincere. I think he has conviction in the material. You can tell when somebody sings a sappy ballad or a sappy love song that it can be contrived and they are not really invested in the material. 
Now, you've got to remember, Coverdale was on the skins of his rear end, and I hear the emotion in his vocals through this song. So I think it's one of the best vocals, uh, vocal performances on the album, even though, for, you know, sonically, it's, you know, completely different to the sort of rock um, sort of lineage that I like for a, for a Whitesnake album. Um, yeah, I get it. It's uh, the, the Sykes uh, guitar solo is very tasty. Um, incidentally, in regards to the video, Tawny Katane was in parts of the video, but the main... Um, they used a, an actual body double um, because I think Tawny Katane for the majority of the uh, the filming of the video was not available. So if you look at the video, um, I think there's some inserts where she's in, but they use a, a model or a, a body double where they have close-ups with uh, between DC and the female protagonist in, in the in the film clip. In Australia, this got played to death. This actually was the biggest White Snake hit. So, on the, in regards to chart um, um, placings or sales, this actually outdid "Here I Go Again" and "Still of the Night." It got absolutely flogged on radio, and it's played to this very day. So, I think on a um, sort of public awareness, I think this would be number two in you know just the, the Joe Average person name a White Snake song that go "Here I Go Again" and "Is This Love." And for what it's worth, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's a mighty fine song, but it's, you know, it's maybe it may be a guilty pleasure. I don't know. Children of the Night. Are you sold on this song, John? Yeah, again, I'm, as I'm as I'm kind of reading through the lyrics again, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, you know, I, I think, again, when, when the album came out, another good little battle cry, you know. Getting ready. I'm in the mood to fool around. It's time for action. Now the boys are back in town. So, you know, you got that kind of, okay, it's time to rev up the testosterone kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I think, again, you, you're getting some of that heavy stuff back. You get some a little bit faster stuff. But I don't know. To me, there's times where it just feels like this is a little choppy. The song sounds choppy to me. Uh, like it was like, like a weird, some weird editing going on in this song. I don't know. Maybe it was just my ears. It just, there's just a couple of times it just sounds off to me. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's just me, but I, again, I think again, lyrically, maybe still not the most Shakespearean or anything, but it, it definitely, it definitely hits you in that testosterone teenage years of saying, okay, let's, you know, let's, let's, let's hit the, let's hit the night. And let's uh, let's go on. Let's because we want to fool around, as they as the lyric says. Um, not a bad track, uh, but yeah, we're as Reed says, we're definitely in we're definitely into the filler territory now. So, um, but yeah, I, I not terribly bad, but not not high on. I probably midway through the. If I was to rank the songs, probably be about midway through there. Yeah. Reed. So, yeah, definitely the last three tracks are what I call the less power section. If you uh, think of 1987 as a Mustang muscle car, the first three tracks are a, a big block V8. The last three tracks are more of a straight six. They get the job done. There's nothing wrong with them. They'll go faster than you need to go. But this is really where I feel that DC and presumably the rest of the band, but I'm just going to you know, put most of the, the creative potential his way. I feel like he's repeating himself in multiple ways. This song is functionally identical to Bad Boys. And I don't mean that it's the same chord progression, it's the same riff. I mean, it serves the exact same function as the song Bad Boys. It's the same theme. It's got the same spirit behind it but it's not as good a song. The lyrics are a little more trite. They're a little more obvious. Um, the interesting thing about the less power section is that these last three songs are not nearly as overproduced as the first three songs. You can hear the instruments better. You can hear the vocals better. There's less reverb. There's less harmonizer. So I think the songs actually sound great. They're the best sounding songs on the album to me, but they are the weakest. Well, excuse me. I don't like the middle three tracks particularly at all, but they are much weaker than the opening three tracks, but they sound better. 
um, uh, wind ups on this song five. Nice. It's interesting you say that it's separated into three sections, maybe because the album took such a long time. Um, that's why it's panned out to sound like it's it's a, an album of three parts. Anyway. Quite possible. Yeah. Tim. Um, so this song, other than other than mistreated, um, because of the whole Richie Blackmore thing, this is the only White Snake song that I could hear Dio do. This sounds like a Dio song to me. This sounds like we rock or yes. stand up and shout. It's a it's an anthem. The riff sounds like a Dio song. You know, and, and the ironic thing is that Vivian Campbell did not play on this album. Um, but yeah, it it almost sounds like it should have been on another White Snake album. And like Reed said, in that bad voice position, we need a song. That like it's got that kind of riff, it's got that kind of tempo. It's odd that both of them are on the same album, uh, and it's very schizophrenic coming right after "Is This Love." Unless that was the goal, was to, I think it comes right after "Is This Love." Am I, am I wrong about that? It does. No, no, you're, you're correct. The, yeah, yeah okay. on the American version. I'm, look, I'm looking at the UK version, and I can't go by that because that's so messed up um, to me. <laughs> and. Uh, but I think maybe that might have been the goal. That might have been it covered it like, all right, well, you know, just when they think, you know, ju just when you think it's safe, they're going to throw a heavy one at you again. So similar to Bad Boys, and obviously they recognized it because, like Peter said, they they often butt them together. You know, do parts parts of Children of the Night and go back into Bad Boys. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. It's almost like one of them, you know, had there been another album with Sykes, one of them probably should have made the next album, but. You know, may maybe they just figured, well, we, we like both of these songs. They are similar. If we put it on another album, they're going to say, well, they just rewrote Bad Boy. So let's put them on the same album and just separate them by sides. So, um, yeah, I, I, yeah. Not, not one thing or the other about it. I don't think it's a bad song. But, yeah, the, the, the album was definitely front loaded. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the thing, even in the day, that sort of uh, I could recognize this was a filler track. And it's, again, the lyrics, um, children of the night. So you've got a middle-aged bloke talking about children of the night. And to me, there was a lot of uh, middle-aged acts in that uh, in the 80s, like your Judas Priest and Uriah Heep um, doing these songs um, directed at teenagers, like schools burning or, um, you know, party all the time or whatnot. I put the lyrics in that sort of category. And even like, you know, in sonically it was interesting. The lyrics to me sort of, ugh, um, you know, even, you know, to a teenager's ears in 1987 didn't quite wash. It's filler. Um, and side two has got a bit of filler. And um, I don't think it's at, it's just not as strong as those, uh, you know, first three songs on the album or the side one to be more precise okay straight for the heart does that go into your heart john no nope. <laughs> it's just it's, i think by this point especially back in the day i think by this point i'd already checked out of of the of the cassette um not that it's a bad rest of the album it's just for whatever reason you get past is this love maybe children of the night and by that time i'm i'm just like okay yeah, this the song didn't. It, it's 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 a love song. It it's a love song with a heavier beat to it. It's not an "Is This Love" or "Here I Go Again," but it's just there. Um, yeah, I don't really have. I, yeah, I, like I said, I I even listened to it again. I'm still yeah, I'm kind of checked out on it by by this point. So emotionally yeah, checked out. Yeah, yeah. By this point, I'm by this point, I'm kind of checked out. So that yeah. it's not bad, but it, it, it but it's uh, yeah, it it didn't hold my interest. Yeah, read. Yeah, I think this song serves the same purpose as "Give Me All Your Love." Uh, in fact, compositionally, there are echoes of of uh, "Here I Go Again" and echoes of "All Your Love" in this song even though it's a little bit more aggressive than either of those. So I don't know which thing they composed first, 
is this Frankenstein from Leftovers or is this the seed that was then split to create two other songs? Could have gone either way. Uh, but because of its position on the album, it definitely comes off as the derivative track rather than the original track. As such, it works. I don't skip it. I don't love it either. Uh, and six wind-ups on this track. So, you know, John is still involved. Just remember, folks, on the bottom of this, uh, there will be a, a tally. We'll, we'll tally it up right at the end. <laughs> All right, Tim, straight for the heart. When, uh, when Martin Popoff and I did our episode of The Contrarians where we picked, you know, we, we created a bad White Snake album, those are all done in tongue in cheek. But I picked Straight for the Heart. This song has never rung true to me. It's so poppy. It's so keyboardy. Hey, here's a question. Who's a keyboardist in White Snake at this time? Don Airy. Nobody. No, yeah, it's a, but isn't it's Don Airy? Yeah. yeah, but he's not on stage with them. And this song is completely driven by keyboards. Um, yeah. it, it's so it's so very poppy. In the hands of another type of band, this song might have worked for me, and I might have thought, what a cool, like a little power poppy type of song. But it's got that heavy smothering drums, uh, like the rest of the album. And yeah, you, you, it reads right. The album did is like a year and a half. It's like a protracted. It's not like they recorded all the tracks in one week. So yeah, it, it, there is a very good reason why it might sound different. You know what this song sounds like? It's like they took that that 87 remix of Here I Go Again, and I take pains to say I'm not talking about the video version. I'm not talking about the version everybody knows. I'm talking about the, the single version that came out for a brief period in 87 and eventually appeared on The Greatest Hits that kicks right in with the entire band. I've never liked it. Wait, and it's got a lot of keyboards. This sounds like a sped-up version of that. So... I've, I've never, it's, I, I, again, it's, you know, it's this guy, you know, old, right? He'd be like 36. He wasn't old, but it, the, the lyrics don't fit, you know, and part of it's the production, you know, a song like this might have fit right in on something like Kiss Unmasked, you know, uh, doesn't fit on this album, doesn't fit this band. You know, it's a perfectly good pop, pop rock song. I just don't think it fits the White Snake canon. Mm. Reed, um, you saw White Snake in 1987. Do you recall, was there any um, keyboardist on the side of the stage? Or any, um, you know? Not that you could see. Now, a lot of bands do tour with offstage keyboardists, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, or, or sometimes they'll put him behind the drums or where you just, there's literally no visual of them at all. So I guess that's yeah. possible, but I don't remember that. No. Yeah. What I do remember is they probably used backing tracks. I remember Vivian and Adrian miming along the keyboard parts on their guitars. <laughs> oh no. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, straight for the heart. I think this is one of the weakest tracks on the album. So if I did a ranking of all the songs on this album, I probably would put this, um, you know, right at the bottom. Um, you know, like Tim, I'd prefer if they put Looking for Love, swap it around, lose this song and put Looking for Love. That could have been a single. Yes. And yeah. we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in more detail. But, um, yeah, look, it's very cliched. The lyrics are cliched. Um, sonically, it's not that interesting. And this, this song is where... Um, you know, the production, um, whether it's Keith Olsen or whether it's Mike Stone, this is all that's bad about the production of 1987. It's very muddied. There's not a, clar a lot of clarity with the instrumentation. And um, it's that wall of sound um, that was so prevalent in the 1980s, you know, the cannon drums, um, the gated drums or whatever. Um, yeah, but so yeah, straight for the heart. I, it's filler. 101 and it's not my it's it's my least favorite of the 1987 tracks all right so we've got the finale on the u.s version of this album um don't turn away do you turn away from this song mr clauser see previous song <laughs> oh okay uh again i've 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 i don't i it's it's funny because I just don't I just don't feel like I have a lot of memories of hearing this song back in the day. 
because by the like I said, I feel like I checked out of the 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 album by this point. Um, you know, I think it's an okay closer. You know, it's not a heavy closer. I think it's it's um, you know, it's not like it's not a here I go again type of sound, but it, you can definitely tell the mood has changed. It's a lot lighter. Um, you know, it's a nice breathe easy kind of uh outro song, but yeah, I I really don't have a lot of memories of listening to this. Um, you know, uh like I said, not a bad song. It would just probably be like one of the, you know, like like you, I think straight from the heart's probably gonna be the bottom. This one would probably be like right above it. So um, and then probably give me all your love would probably be above that. So yeah, um, yeah, I got I really don't have much to say on this one. Sorry. Yeah, that's all, all right. I got. Okay, read. Yeah, I think it fits right in with the other songs in the less power section. Any one of these would have been fine B-sides on singles. Um, this song, again, not only has echoes of, uh, here I go again, I have to check my notes, make sure I'm crediting the right song. But so it's got parts that are very reminiscent of here I go again in it. The most interesting thing about it is right towards the end of the song, there's a callback to still of the night. Um, not in the, it doesn't have the riff, but kind of, oh, well, now I don't know how to describe it. Anyway, listen to the last minute of the song and see if you don't think that there's a section that is a callback to still of the night. And that um, I think is actually stylistically a very interesting thing to do in your last track is then to have elements, intentional elements, not like ripoff elements, but we're, we're going to play 30 seconds, which make you think of a previous song because it kind of loops the album, right? Like a snake eating its tail, I guess, would be the appropriate metaphor here. Um, and it's, again, I don't hate this song, but I don't love it. It's okay. I don't skip it. Um, and it's got six windups. So in the last three songs, we have uh, 17 windups between the last three songs. So thank you, John. Uh, I'll always miss those. Coming home with and, the wet uh, sail. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Tim. I think I know what Reed means. Uh, it does change towards the end. It gets a little bit more epic sounding. And I think that might be what you mean um, because it, the, the, the feel of the song does change as it fades out. You know, I'm a little surprised that Geffen didn't say, oh, why not? Let's throw this out as a single too. This could have been a fifth single. I mean, this is the days when, they, you know, they put seven singles off Def Leppard's Hysteria, exact same time. They could have shot a video for it. It might have hit the top 40. It's more accessible than Give Me All Your Love. It is similar to Here I Go Again in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, it's got the, 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 the not slow, but it, it's got the sort of uh, more, less instrumentation in the verse. And then the chorus kicks in and it's got that dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, like it's got that sort of and there's even a little bit you know when he sings before the night dun, 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 like there's a that's very similar to a guitar part and here i go again without sounding like a, a carbon copy i think it's the best song of the last three tracks on here and again i'm really surprised that that they didn't push this as a single i don't mean push this instead of here i go again or is this love but once those songs hit this might have you know hit the top 30 just on momentum and sold a few more albums, you know, that's, and it's, I think it does fit closing the album. I don't know why I think that is, but obviously I can't be the only one because even the UK version ends on this song. So yeah, not a lot to say, but I don't think it's bad. Yeah. I don't mind it. I think it's a, it's a fine album closer. And I agree with you, Tim, it's the best of the final three. The thing that I gravitate in this song is the outro or when it gets kind of dramatic towards the end, it kind of shifts gears. And I think, you know, for an album closer, that's great. You know, hits on a bit of a high. I agree. Should have been a single. Throw it out there. I mean, Michael Jack, this is the era of Michael Jackson yeah. thriller where they put eight singles or nine singles out. So, you know, throw it out. I think it would have done fine. Anyway, I think it's not a bad uh, album closer. Um, and, uh, yeah. So there we have it, 1987. That's the US track listing. 
Um, might have a, just a quick uh, throw around if you're familiar with the song Looking for Love, which was on the UK version of this album. What do you think of it? John, are you familiar with this song? Yeah, I've, I was listening to it a couple of times because I do, like I said, I do have this box set, this 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 big yeah. old thing. So yes, it does have the, uh, the UK track listing. To me, um, Looking for Love kind of sounds like it's a hodgepodge of of a couple of different songs. Like I heard little bits of at least two or three other songs from the album. Um, don't ask me which parts, but I, I, I just, I, I'm like, I feel like, I feel like this was a hodgepodge uh, song. Wasn't a bad song, a little long, about six minutes or so, but it just didn't have that epic feel to me, like still of the night does, but a little, a little Frankenstein-y to me, but that that's really about all I, I I I don't know that very well after that. Okay. Read. Uh I've never heard it. But okay. I do want to take this uh this time and say uh Tim's mentioned the radio edit of Here I Go Again several times. Uh Denny Carmasi is actually credited as the drum player on that, and Dan yeah. Huff as playing guitar. Now, probably they just played individual pieces that were then put into the song but i mean that contributes to the fact that it sounds so different from the regular version of it but i don't have anything to say about the song you're actually asking about so okay <laughs> that's all right tim you know what um i'm not sure um who it is but there's fretless bass on this song but that's not the only reason this song sounds like a dry run for the Blue Murder album. This song could have totally fit on the Blue Murder album. It reminds me of Out of Love, the big battle right. on there. That's mm. what I hear. Um, even the phrasing of the vocals, it almost sounds like Sykes may have had more to do with the, not the lyric writing, but the way that the, you know, he may have hummed a melody, you know, this is what I hear going along with this music. Um, I like it. Uh, the first time that, you know, I think most people in North America heard it, it didn't have the import version. I didn't even know these songs existed until the Greatest Hits album came out in 94. So yeah, the Greatest Hits album had that 87 remix of Here I Go Again. It had this song. It had another song, which we're going to talk about. And it had the song Sweet Lady Luck, which was from the Slip of the Tongue uh, era. Um, I like this song. I think it would have made the album pretty weighed down with slower tempo songs. But in its own right, I think it's pretty good. But the combination of the tempo the way that the guitar sounds and the fretless bass. This is, this is a template for the Blue Murder album, I think. Yeah. I think it should have been on the album. Um, I really like it a lot. And that was on the flip side of the 12-inch single of Still the Night. So when I first heard this song. But um, I think it's got a lot of drama. And, ah, uh, yeah, the bass playing, it's right up in the mix. It's one of the better produced songs on the album where you hear a little bit more clarity um, in the instrumentation um, comparative to the other songs on this album. So, but, yeah, I think it should have been on the album. Um, but anyway, all right. Um, Reed, you saw White Snake in the Day. Um, can you share some recollections of um, what you thought of them live? Um, assuming yeah. you saw them support Motley Crue or it was in that Motley Crue girl, girls, girls era? Uh, no. Well, okay. It was in that era, but by the time I saw them, um, this album was the number one album in the country and they were headlining. Okay. So uh, I saw them with Vivian Campbell and Adrian Vandenberg on guitar and uh, Rudy Sarzo on bass. And I'm sorry, I never remember drummers who was playing drums on that. Bobby Aldridge. Bobby Aldridge. Bobby Aldridge. Bobby Aldridge. Yeah. Um, I thought they did great. Now, you could not help but notice that neither Adrian Vandenberg nor Vivian Campbell are John Sykes. So no matter what I make fun of John Sykes is playing because he has so many things I can poke fun at, but he's a very distinctive guitarist and you can't put a price on that, right? So when there's somebody else playing John's parts, you notice immediately that it's not John playing. But they did things like on the uh, on that lick for uh, Still of the Night, they would trade off between them so that one guitarist would go, and then they joined back in the middle. That kind of stuff was awesome. Um, Adrian and Vivian didn't seem like they would be a good combination. They're very different players. They're both 
very hot players. They're very fast players. But I think what made it work is something about Adrian in a two guitar situation. He steps back. Vivian was absolutely the front guy in terms of guitar players for the songs. So he took most of the solos. Adrian's playing a lot of the, uh, a lot of rhythm. Uh, Viv, I love you. You're not a great rhythm player live. He spends too much time. He's a hot licks guy. He just wants to play the solos. He wants to play the fills. Um, you know, if you go back and look at videos of him playing with Dio, he's barely playing the riffs in those songs. He is just the hot licks guy. And he needs another guy behind him who's providing a solid foundation. And even though I would not have thought of Adrian Vandenberg as the solid uh, rhythm player, Vandenberg's apparently like the ultimate team player. And he's just willing to step back and, and mostly let Viv do it. Um, the funniest thing that I remember from the concert is that they both got to do guitar solos. David Coverdale introduced them both times uh, before they started playing or after they played. And of course he in uh, Adrian Vandenberg from Denmark. And then he said after Vivian, he said, and Vivian Campbell from Denmark, wait, we've got another effing Dane in the band. And I thought, you know, you have to know the guys from Ireland. This, <laughs> this isn't the, <laughs> they'd been on the road for months and months, but I understand that once you're on stage, these things might slip your mind. Hell, they slip my mind now. Um, but it was a really fun concert. I remember it was the kind of concert where you look out across the audience and all the dudes are headbanging and all the women are dancing. And uh, for me, there's no better hard rock concert than that. Yeah, I think people need to remember that for a moment in time, Whitesnake, in, at least in North America, were one, one of the biggest bands. Absolutely. It was a lightning yeah, was in the huge. bottle experience. And I think, Tim, as you said at the start of the show, from you know, just for a brief moment, they were right at the top, and then a couple of years later, it was kind of all over. Um, all right, I'm going to put it out to you guys. Out of the three, who is the most valuable player in the, the success of White Snake 1987? Is it Tawny Katane being the, the figurehead in the videos? Is it John Sykes and his guitar playing? Or is it David Coverdale? John Clauser, think about it. What for is me, the reason for this eight million in America? I mean, if for me, it's Sykes. It's it was the guitar playing that 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 grabbed my attention because I was just starting to play guitar for a few years at that point. So for me, I was looking at the guitarist or listening for the guitar player. I I kind of didn't watch MTV all that much at that point. So for me, the videos didn't play that big of a role for me personally. So that that would be my take. I was for me, it was Sykes. Okay. Reed. Yeah, I got to give the nod to uh, David Coverdale on this one. So you have two very different things happening here with this album. One, I'm just going to include myself in the tribe of heavy metal fans. If you're a member of the heavy metal fan tribe, John Sykes is the reason that you loved those songs because he was phenomenal. You probably bought 500, 600,000 copies of the album collectively. The other seven and a half million copies of that album were bought by other people who would not normally have bought White Snake albums. This is how a band has their most successful album is because people who wouldn't normally buy it bought it. And it's not heavy metal fans. There wasn't another heavy metal band, well, except Def Leppard. And it's, guess what? It's the same situation. It's not normal Def Leppard fans buying hysteria. It's everybody else. It's pop fans. It's literally the entire world, right? So um, if you look at, again, they had a number one song, which is phenomenal. Try and name all of the hard rock songs you can think of that were number one songs. And a number two song very shortly after that, that makes them amazingly successful. But the people who bought those, well, again, John Sykes is almost not involved in those songs. Adrian Vandenberg plays the solo in one. He And John plays, if he's playing rhythm in uh, uh, whatever the ballad is, doggone it, stupid brain. Um, is this love? You can't hear him. 
is this love? Yes, thank you. So his only contribution, his only easily listenable oral contribution is the solo. And I guarantee that seven and a half million people did not buy that because it's John Sykes' tastiest solo. They bought it because the song was already great for them. Again, it's not a song I like. And his solo did not detract from that. If he had come in with the solo on Still of the Night, that song would not have reached number two, right? Still, the, or uh, um, here I go again, would not have reached number one with that solo. It was too aggressive. So as much as I love Sykes playing on this, and I make fun of him because he's make funnable, but um, I have to give it to DC. Okay. Tim. Oh, it's, it's Coverdale, no question. Um, and I love John Sykes, and I love Blue Murder. Talked about them at length. We've talked about them at length. But I try to look at it, and, and Reed has taken so many things that I was going to say he put them so well. Um, Thank you. What, when You have to look at it in the cold light of day. We're not talking about people like us that study the music, that read the liner notes, that know who played on what and know all of this stuff. Looking at it, with that big wide world out there. And you're right, this album was a phenomenon. A band of this hard rock category typically doesn't sell 8 million copies. You know, they typically sell, you know, their biggest album might be, you know, something like Cinderella Night Songs, 3 million, very admirable. 8 million, I mean, it's way, way up there. Um, It takes pop hits to do that. And they happen to have two big pop hits. We have to stress that, you know, a lot of times we say something, something went to number one or did this or do that. I'm not talking about the Billboard mainstream rock chart. I'm talking about the Hot 100, the pop chart, the radio stations that played everything. I'm talking yes. about Casey Kasem and Rick Reese, uh, Rick Reese, uh, Rick Dees. Number one, here I go again. Number two is this love competing with, I think, I think if I'm remembering this right, I think that Is This Love was beat out of the number one spot by Whitney Houston, so emotional. So that shows you the company that this band was keeping. Um, They weren't rubbing shoulders with, you know, Scorpions and, you know, bands like that. They were up there with the Debbie Gibsons and the Tiffany's, you know, the things that were going on in late 87, 88. And they still managed these two huge singles. Now, and, and Reed is absolutely right. Sykes' participation on those songs is very, very minimal. He, as much as he would have liked to, he never went on to become a household name. He's known to us in the guitar community. He's beloved. You know, he, he is laughable in some ways. And, 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 and you can make fun of his over bands and his windups and all that. We do. We, you know, we love his playing. Those aren't the songs that the average person knows. They know those two songs. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say, as there are more people that no, here I go again, then is this love. And that's not just the difference of one uh, position point on the chart. It's that here I go again is such a unique song. And as soon as it comes on, it's instantly recognizable. Um, when I saw them in concert and they went into, and they went into is this love, I swear I got the vibe around me of more people going, oh, this song. Oh, they do this song. They knew the song. They just didn't know which of the myriad hard rock bands did it. Was it Great White? Was it White Lion? Was it White Snake? Um, was it someone that didn't have white in their name at all? So you know what I mean? Like it, it, it the in in the whole wide world, you know, zooming way out of the hard rock community, zooming way out of people that, that study the music like we do. It's David Coverdale's voice. He sold those songs, you know, and that's one of the greatest strengths that he has. You know, he does have that naturally, you know, bluesy tone uh, to his voice. And even if he's singing a book, complete nonsense, he can sell you on it because he's got the voice and the voice is what people respond to. And good point about both of the guitar solos in those songs, too, because a really, really harsh guitar solo will not get AM radio play. And both of these songs did because they were relatively short solos and they weren't really all that over the top. The other thing I want to mention about Coverdale's voice is that um, I'm not a, the biggest fan of this live material because, again, as Reed said, it's not Sykes playing these songs. And that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be bad. 
but they don't even attempt to play the main melodies of the solos, which to me, it, it just sounds like, why did you hire these two guys? They didn't even learn the songs. To me, not playing, I don't mean note for note and exactly all the right spots and the, the right bins in the right places, but at least play the meat of the potatoes, the, the hook of the solo that people know. Mm. You can do your own little embellishments around it, but to me, that's like changing the lyrics of a song. It's not a good look. They do that all the time on here to the point where the, the songs don't even quite sound right. Some of them do, some of them don't. There is an extended solo that both of them do on here. But the one thing I do like about this live recording compared to just two years later on that live at Donington, David Coverdale is singing. He's not screaming his head off on here. He actually sings really, really well on this, this recording. And I'm guessing it was like that for most of the tour. I don't know why on that slip of the tongue tour um he made this decision i'm just going to scream my head off it's no wonder he did damage whatever whatever strength his he regained in his voice due to the surgery he lost it and i don't think he ever really got it back but yeah you know it, it was it was an interesting point in time I, I you know it was a fun point in time i i was you know right in the thick of it reading all the magazines and buying the albums and I was such a student of it. And it was fun discovering those early Whitesnake albums, too. And I knew that, you know, someday, you know, I never, I only read bits and pieces in Circus Knit Parader about what actually happened. And someday I'm going to get the full story about what, why, why are all these changes happening to this one band where some other bands, you know, where a band like Def Leppard, their drummer loses an arm and they don't get rid of him. Why is this band, why is this band, since I've, in the three years I've gotten to know them, completely, you know, shuffled or changed houses so to speak and it only continued with the whole vivian it gone steve vian and all of that so yeah uh but th this album um i think is fully deserving of i'm glad it sold as well as it did you know uh coverdale worked hard for it he took a big gamble and it paid off yeah nicely said tim well i think this is david coverdale's project it's not John Sykes' project, so obviously I have to defer and say it's um, David Coverdale is the most valuable player. John Sykes, very important. Tawny Katane on the visuals, but da it's David Coverdale. He is the one who put his balls on the line to get this project, and he had so much to lose. It paid off in spades, but in a sense, it may have been a bit of a, a leg iron around his waist pinned to a, a sonic moment in time, which, you know, three or four years later uh, may have been seen as passe and a bit dated. What I want to throw to you guys is two questions. Do you think that if John Sykes and that lineup had actually toured, do you think the band would have had a long shelf life? And do you think that they would have, in, you know, the trajectory of the, the tour would have continued? And do you think the whole image of um, White Snake as a hair band with the bells and whistles and the, you know, the, I think um, David uh, Coverdale described it as uh, dressed up kind of like a Santa Claus. Do you think that, you know, if they may have had that more street approach, um, they would have had a, a longer shelf life, even to this day? What do you think, John? Hmm. You know, I, I boy, I'm not sure I can. I, I'm not sure I can really even answer that because being being such the casual fan, it's I, it, it's almost hard for me to think about that. I would have loved to have seen them tour this album with Sykes, Murray, and Dun and Dunbar. Dunbar. I think I think that would have been a very interesting sound. I would have liked to have seen it. Uh, would have had shelf life. You know, hard to say. I think, uh, I think, given the climate, if they had done, you know, it might have been a, it may have just been a very tough album to to uh, follow up. You know, how do you follow up two big number number one and number two songs? It's that's not a that's not exactly an easy thing to do. Hmm. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know if I could really, I don't know if I could, I don't, I don't, I don't think it would have. Uh, I think they would have petered out kind of quickly. Yeah. And I and even even without even without Sykes and, and all those guys, they kind they kind of did. 
Absolutely. Wow. And between 87 and 89 wins Slip of the Tongue. I mean, Slip of the Tongue only did one platinum. So that is a major drop in a period of two years. So whether it's the climate of what was out in music in that two-year period. I want to say yeah. one quick thing about the Slip of the Tongue thing. And one of the bigger songs from that was another redone song. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Going to the well again. Reed, what do you think of the proposition of uh, Sykes going out on the band? And do you think they could have had a, a bigger shelf life if they stripped it and toned it down, the whole image? Well, and you know, I mean, uh, I think in point of fact, no. Which, um, again, you, so if you look at the two worlds here of the heavy metal fans and the rest of humanity, would Sykes have appealed to us as the heavy metal fans? Yes. But even people our age, we're all relatively similar in age. Tim's actually the youngest of us. Um, be honest with yourself. Did you buy Blue Murder in stores when it came out? I did. I had it yeah. on cassette. I was the only person I knew who had it on cassette back in yeah. the day. Uh, that was not a big selling album. And that represented the best John Sykes had to offer. I mean, you know, he, he had something to prove. I love that album. It wasn't a commercially successful album and it wasn't going to be a commercially successful album. Um, so I, if they had stuck in that vein, no, they were, they were going to do exactly what they did with slip of the tongue, which was they still had a platinum album, which is, you know, for by other people's standards, by previous White Snake standards, even that was fantastic. But you can't follow an eight times platinum with a one time platinum and, and have your record company think that you're doing your job. So that was going to be the end of the road for them, regardless. Uh, but with the benefit of hindsight, I have to say that I believe John Kalodner, as much as I think he is a freak, um, was exactly correct. If they had jettisoned Sykes and just, or let Sykes write songs and not play on the albums, and they had gone 100% commercial and they had done more power ballads and they had just been Aerosmith part two, that would have been their road to continued success. Aerosmith survived the assault of grunge, which is absolutely amazing. But they did it because they were not even pretending to compete in the hard rock space anymore. By then, they were a pop act, 100%. We're over here. You guys are fighting for your little piece of whatever's going on over there. We're over here in the pop world now where people are still willing to buy millions of our albums. And if White Snake had done that, I think they might have survived. But I also think it would have killed David Coverdale. David Coverdale is not necessarily Mr. Artistic Integrity, but... I think that there is enough of him that wants to stay in that hard blues rock vein that he would have found it very unsatisfying to go 100% pop and continue his career. Tim. So many good points there, Reed. Yeah, and, and Kalodner talked about that in, in Martin's Whitesnake book. Um, if Whitesnake had been able to do what Aerosmith did, which Aerosmith had, Permanent Vacation, Pump, and Get a Grip. Six, seven, eight million selling albums. They did it three times in a row with about three, four singles, big singles off of each one of those albums. That sustained that career, like Reed said, through grunge. Whereas Whitesnake became, became almost like the shoot on sight, you know, even though they had more of that ped more pedigree than most of the other bands, they became a laughing stock. But I do have to say, that David Coverdale strikes me as someone who's very set in his ways and very slow to change. Not change members, but change himself. And what I mean by that is his comments that talk about him looking like an over-decorated Christmas tree, those are retroactive comments. I don't think that he would have listened to someone in 1988 or, or 89 when, uh, you know, when the machine was gearing up to make more videos and go out on the road. I'm not even talking about who was in the band at this point. And say, you know, why don't you guys try dressing down a little bit? Why don't you guys, you know, point more of a, to a band like Tesla that was more just jeans and, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and just, you know, flat hair, you know, long hair, but not, not big hair, uh, not, you know, not dyed blonde. 
And, you know, if he'd have gone more of a look, the sort of look that he did adopt in the late 90s, where it's very short hair and, and back to a dark, it's natural color, um, you would at least look at those videos and think, wow, you know, something different is going on here. The music wouldn't have had to have been all that different. I do think that he and Sykes wrote really, really well together. And, you know, uh, yes, Here I Go Again was an older song. But is this love was number two? That's a Coverdale Sykes. You know, th there was something there. The best ideas that ended up on the Blue Murder album, the best ideas lyrically maybe that Coverdale might have had on Slip of the Tongue, which I do like, but um, it's sort of an outlier because of Steve Vai's playing on it. It sounds so different. If Sykes, th that combination may have turned into something where the grunge, you know, they may have still been affected by grunge, but they may have had a slightly longer run. They may have had maybe two or three more albums instead of just one more album. Um, and even, you know, yeah, for Slip of the Tongue to come out and only go one uh, once platinum, within two years, that album was in the cutout bins with, with holes punched in it, which is crazy yeah. for now in the sort of million cop. They made, they manufactured too many. They thought it was going to sell the way yes. the last one did. I mean, I think, over time, I think even Slide It In is double platinum in the States. I think it. I think that it sold a lot of copies on the strength of 1987. Slip of the Tongue was not going to do it. It didn't have the surefire hit single. For, for Your Loving, I love the original. I don't mind the remake, but it's too heavy. It's like it's not as heavy as Still the Night, but it's still too heavy for pop radio. There's no way that was going to be the song that, that broke big like Here I Go Again did. It did about what you'd expect. I think it hit number 38 on the pop chart. And then you had The Deeper the Love, which is probably the most commercial thing on Slip of the Tongue. And it hit 28. It wasn't, it just wasn't time anymore for yes. White Snake. I don't know if it would have mattered if Sykes had stayed with, but I do know that Coverdale and Sykes, when they weren't butting heads, wrote great songs. Um, and each of them have proven that they can write on their own, but sometimes you need that, that push pull to, uh, you know, like I said, we might have gotten two or three more White Snake albums before the inevitable uh, slump. And we may have had a situation where, you know, he comes out, you know, as we discussed, Restless Heart, that didn't even initially get an American release. That's how far they had come in less than 10 years from having an 8 million selling album to having some exec at Geffen go, I don't know if we want to put this out. So mm. it's it's a it's a it's fun to hypothesize on it. Yes. But I do think that an image change might have helped a little bit as, as far as outside perception, like people that aren't necessarily fans. Maybe if they'd have started dressing down a little bit sooner than they did, who, who can say? They may have overstayed that part of it. Absolutely. No, not nicely put. Well, I've got a theory, um, and I've said this in another show with Peter Jones. Um, I think in the slided in era, they were sonically picking up a lot of very basic song structures a la ACDC. If they had that stripped back image, and I'm talking about the video clips, yeah, you know, denim, T-shirt, you know, natural hair, and did that sort of ACDC sort of very meat and potatoes, I think they would have had a better, bigger shelf life, possibly right into today. So you had John... Colander, he was actually taking notes on the side of the stage when they had Mick Moody in the band. He's playing all this sort of uh, boogie 1970s uh, rock licks. And you've got John Colander taking notes to say, like, you know, you're not made for the band. You know, video-wise, video you just don't suit the image that will cut through in America. I think Coverdale was listening to Colander way too much and following the trends of the day. But if he followed the theme of what was happening with Slide It In and kept it simple and a bit more meat and potatoes, I think it would have had more legs. And, you know, I, I just, just real quick, Peter, you made me actually made me think of something I never thought of before. Because Slide It In did open a few doors. I think it went gold in its initial run. Yes. Um, and to some people, that was the first White Snake album. But, but for the most part, it was 1987. Imagine for a moment if Slide It In, that album, the songs exactly as they are, was the album to follow up 1987. That had songs that were potential, potential hit singles that really could have, like Love Ain't No Stranger, Guilty of Love, and Give Me More Time. 
could have been a different story if that had been the album because it was stripped back. The band looked did didn't look quite as made up, but they still looked photogenic in the videos. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, that's my theory. I think if they followed that more sort of traditional meat and potatoes rock with a little bit of guitar hero, you know, sort of embellishment, I think it would have had a longer shelf life right to this today. Because I've seen White Snake in America and I saw him in Long Beach supporting um, Judas Priest. And it was a bit sad. There was only like 300 in the audience before Judas Priest were um, came on stage with the uh, British Steel anniversary concert. One of my favourite bands I'm seeing in America, and there's only about 300 diehards, and they they started off the set at 7 o'clock at night in daylight. David Coverdale's Ruthless. So during the making of this album, apparently everyone who played their part was fired. Ainsley Dunbar did his drum line. He was let go. Neil Murray. This is Neil Murray that started with the band in 1978. Yeah. Let go. John Sykes heard about this and he, he thought, shit, I better get into the studio and record all my guitar parts or or else uh, David's going to um, give me the punt. And yeah. then there was this infamous uh, car park um, confrontation where, <laughs> where where the cub was in his uh, car and I think John Sykes yeah. is banging on the door. But um, look, why did he sack the band? More money. It all comes yeah. back to, you know, he royalties. And and I think he could see the writing on the wall that um, the partnership with John Sykes, whilst very artistically, I think on a personal level, it was two alpha males like Richie Blackmore and Ian Gillen. It wasn't going to last a long time. So I think he was at that point of his life. He didn't want anything to screw up um, his dream to conquer America. And he got... Um, a group of musicians that on paper seemed to be like hit all the right spots, you know, probably were very aimable, um, even though maybe that might be debatable with Vivian Campbell and could at least last the tour. I don't think DC and John Sykes would have lasted the tour because I've heard John Sykes had, he didn't want another guitarist in the band. It was only going to be one that was going to be a point of contention. So I don't think it was that relationship was made to last, unfortunately. And um, the rest is all history and it's speculation. There's a lot of other reasons. I've heard a lot of other rumours why John Sykes was, um, was uh, you know, fired from the band. But um, I think the big story that I hear from a lot of different sources was it came down to royalties. And, um, you know, I think that um, Coverdale wanted to, you know, basically feather his nest and make sure that um, he was in a very rock solid position. But um, kudos, that's the the era of the 80s and um, greed is good, I don't know. And I think that basically that he wanted to do, you know, he, he followed that dream. And I think it's one of the most remarkable comeback stories when you read stories that he was like um, couch surfing in LA in the eighties. And then a couple of years later, he's at the, you know, at the American music awards, uh, accepting awards or doing whatever. I think that's a remarkable comeback story. Okay, guys, this has been an epic show. Just one more round. What do you think of the album now? Thumbs up, thumbs down or undecided JC. I gave it two thumbs up. I still, I, and like I said, it still takes me back to being that teenager in 1987, 88. So I still, I can still appreciate a lot of the, the big, the bigger tracks off this. Okay. Reed. Uh, I like it less now than I did in 1987, but that's only because I listen to more bluesy music now than I used to. Um, so I prefer the earlier White Snake, but it's still a good album. It still has the three best opening tracks on any white snake albums and if it was only made up of three songs it would still be worth purchasing those first three tracks i love them that much okay so that's a it's a meh <laughs> tim i have to give it two thumbs up because it was an important album for me getting into uh harder rock music it was among like the first 10 or so albums i ever bought with my own money so I've got a nostalgia for it too. But for the most part, even though you know I've been critical of production, for the most part, 
I still think it holds up pretty well. Okay. So two thumbs up from Tim. Two thumbs up from me. I'm sort of, I prefer the old White Snake, the classic White Snake era, but I, I appreciate where it lands in the discography. I rate it as a, a top five um, White Snake album, and it's a very important album in 80s rock. And um, yeah, look, it's is it perfect? No, but um, no, I think it's it's a mighty fine album. Thank you, guys. Wow, this has been an epic chat. I think we've covered it left, right, up, down. Um, John Clauser, My Music Corner, check out his channel. Thank you for your contributions to the show. Read little Thank as always. Love your commentary on The Contrarians. And Tim Derling, my Whitesnake colleague. I think uh, we've we've covered Whitesnake top and bottom, but I'm sure that there's some more topics we'll cover somewhere um, from Tim's Vinyl Confessions. Please check out his channel. Please like and subscribe to Rock Daydream Nation. Tell us what you think. I'm sure that there's going to be a few comments, good, bad, or indifferent in regards to this album. But uh, one thing's for sure, I've really enjoyed having you gentlemen on this show. And uh, I think we gave uh, the analysis of this album a fair shake. So um, well done. And um, yeah, see you soon. Cheers. Thanks, Peter. <laughs>